good is defined by the audience. Good is defined by the sum of its results. So you can make something that you feel is great, but if the audience doesn't know that it delivers what they're hoping to receive, they're, they're not gonna score it good. Hey there, and welcome to yet another episode of the World of Presentations podcast, brought to you by Asset Presentation Agency 356 Labs, where we not only develop presentations and train people from some of the biggest brands out there, but we also organize and host the largest presentation skills conference in the world called Present to Succeed. I'm Boris, the founder of 356 Labs and your host for today's episode. And with me, I have yet another incredible guest from our industry. He worked and continues to work for some of the biggest brands in the world. In the world, he was a designer, senior development specialist, and then director of development in the biggest presentation agency out there, Duarte. Mark, they're still the biggest agency, right? Yes. I'm pretty absolutely. sure, yeah. I also believe so. What else? Now, however, he runs an agency with his <laughs> wife, and he's responsible for many things, but one of them he calls create he's responsible for creative solutions for specialized client projects that is so well said his name is mark Hicks, <laughs> and i can't wait uh, to ask him a few things that i personally am super curious about so let's roll mark welcome to the podcast yeah thanks for having me on boris i'm uh, i'm always happy to talk to people that are interested in this this particular arena because uh it's actually a big one. Yeah. Now that now that I have read from my notes, because I don't want to get anything wrong, let's <laughs> get to the questions. How did you end up being in the presentation space? Like, what happened? Everyone has a story. You for sure have a story. What is what happened? Yeah. So that's um, you know, I think a lot of people that work in design or work in business have always been making presentations, right? That, that's that's sort of the just standard today. But there's making presentations and there's actually knowing presentations. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been a fairly successful, I, for whatever measure that is, right? I, I'd done okay with my career. And um, I was a senior image expert at Apple and knew the Apple brand really, really well. I was kind of a Photoshop guy over there. I'd worked with multiple agencies. And then at one point, the way that I, that I consider my true dive into presentation design was with Duarte. And so I uh, was um, connected with a particular team at Duarte that ran the Apple account. Yeah. And they said, hey, um, you were suggested to us as a production designer because you worked at Apple. Apple suggested me to Duarte. And so I did um, some contract work for them for a while. And I was completely floored by uh, this genre of design that I had just never seen anyone focus on, right? As a graphic designer, you sort of think, oh, I can design magazines and articles and websites and you know everything. But here was an entire agency dedicated and committed, you know, 98% of what they did was presentation work. And so I was floored by the quality of how they thought about things and, and just the methodologies and the approaches and the people, the spirit behind it. These were designers that were passionately in love with what they were doing and yeah. um, trying to change the perception that, well, because it's PowerPoint or because it's Keynote, you know, it's not real design as, as a lot of people would yeah. jokingly say when they came in the door, you know, why aren't you using InDesign or why aren't you using these, these industry standard tools? And the, that yeah. was the first perception, right? How do you change what is an industry standard tool? Well, PowerPoint has literally hundreds of millions of users. I would call that an industry standard tool. So I ended up getting a job with Duarte. Uh, I was there for quite a few years, eventually got to be the director of development there where I oversaw uh, professional development for the creative teams and creative staff. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, a good run, but that, that has now led to being involved in presentations for almost 15 years, I All think right. maybe a little bit more. That's a lot. So I think that it was in the presentation podcast. And by the way, 
shameless plug here, the presentation podcast, our colleagues, Sandy, Troy, Nolan, you are on their podcast, their podcast together with ours for first year ever, by the way, that is a surprise I forgot to mention that at the beginning was rated by those guys at, let me find the link of Feedspot, Feedspot as two of the podcasts that are in the top 15 presentations podcasts in the world. The presentation podcast is the first one that's absolutely well-deserved, but we're on position number Great. three, which is now you should feel special. Wow. You know? Now you're also here. Then you need I, to I attack, do? if you haven't attacked <laughs> the guys and our colleagues at the presentations presentation boss podcast, I think those guys are in Australia. So I know them. I can connect you, you know, so it's easy. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just yeah, making my so way down the list. <laughs> I had this one question. I think it was in the presentation podcast when you said that when you went in Duarte, you were, as you are now saying, like completely shocked and like, what's going on? Like these people are on yeah. another level. Like, I think you said something in regards to you are not expecting how much stuff is in there in order to make a truly effective presentation. Can you kind of go there for a second? Because I think that is super interesting from the designer perspective for someone to hear, hey, how much stuff is in there to make a successful presentation? Yeah, so I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, I, I wasn't new to design, right? I had done lots of projects, very big and small projects. Um, when I got to Duarte, you know, as a designer who had done a lot of work, I just sort of assumed, yeah, I can, I can design content, you know, and, and I knew it wouldn't be super easy, but what I didn't realize was the, the surgical level of engineering that they put into designing presentations. I mean, down to every measurement, every piece of content, you know, for example, when, when designers design layouts and brochures, um, we've all done that at some point, if you've worked in design, you, you get content from someone and you lay it out and you think, oh, columns, rows, right? Duarte would ask you to read it. And they would say, do you understand it? Do you really know what this is about? How does the design connect with the content? And then you would test it. You would go into multiple rooms and you would put it up on the projector. You would then put it on a different screen. Then you would put it on a different system. Then you would have someone else uh, that you would walk through it. They would tell you to, uh, if you have a talk track, you know, the notes, actually go through and click through it and try to use the script that the presenter, put yourself in the shoes of the presenter. And suddenly this was a totally different experience, right? Um, and you started realizing I have to think differently about how to do this. So the the breadth of that just meant that you had to up your game um, as far as being a, a creative contributor to to the assets we were building. That is truly, truly when I heard when I like when I was listening to that episode in the presentation podcast and I heard you saying with all of that experience that you have, when I heard you saying that I was like, okay. Like that is some serious stuff that he is saying here. And it's very interesting and very intriguing, by the way, to see a little bit behind the scenes of how they approach it, because obviously having customers and clients like mm -hmm. Apple requires you to be constantly on the top of your game, because I don't, uh, I don't think that Apple will accept anything else, right? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's people there like their creative director, Ryan Orcutt, who is probably one of the greatest presentation designers I've ever, ever worked with. He just has that balance of content and vision. Um, but I remember when I started there, I worked for an art director whose uh, name was James Nipomaceno, and he was handling some really big Fortune 100 accounts as well. And uh, after working there for six months, I remember saying, I think I should quit. I don't think I'm getting this. I don't think I'm good at this. You know, uh, I just, maybe this isn't the genre for me um, because the standard is just so high and, and I didn't feel like I was getting it. And, um, you know, James never gave up on me. Other people at Duarte never gave up on me. And they said, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> Everybody, everyone, everyone goes through this when you come to Duarte and you try to figure out what the standard is. So I'm very thankful to shout out to those guys for believing me and supporting me at that point. And look, it, it kind of put me where I am today. So 
let's talk about like your ideas, like the people that are going to listen to this one and like, I don't care about that stuff. Let's, do, let's, let's, let's get to the, let's get to the <laughs> real advices here, the tips and tricks, the practical things that I can take from, uh, from Mark, like what sure. are you have done so much design for so many brands now presentation design for so many years, like what, because the people that are listening to this one are business professionals. They are not presentation designers or presentation experts per se, sure. I'll break that table at the end. Uh, <laughs> for some reason it's just constantly moving. Um, anyway, what is your best, like, what do you advise or what would you advise the business professional to do or to learn or to do both? Uh, right. So that at the end of the day, they are able, they're capable, and they know how they can build otherwise very good looking, very effective slides by themselves. Because not everyone can hire Duarte or us or you or whoever. Sure. But still, you don't have to be a designer, I think, to be able to create slides that are still going to differentiate you. What are the skills? What, do you, what would you advise people to do and learn and all of that? Yeah, so probably the number one piece of advice I give people these days, right? And obviously there should be a minimum expectation mm -hmm. of good design, but good design doesn't mean decoration. Um, to me, good design means focus. And so you don't have to be a business person who goes out and studies graphic design and suddenly learns you know, color theory and grid theory. And, and I love all that. And if you want to learn that, you will definitely enjoy the experience more, but... It's really about making sure you can provide um, a target, right? So the idea, and we hear this in all the books, right? One big idea per slide, give them one thing to look at. We all preach that. But where I think is, is a helpful tip or practice is we take our clients and we run them through the assumption okay. exercise. And the assumption exercise is actually to go um, first start at the parent level and say, what is the topic that you're presenting on? Now, this could be you're reporting to an executive. This could be you're speaking at a conference. doesn't matter. First and foremost is, if I gave you a title of a talk, immediately you're making assumptions of what that talk is about. So do, are those assumptions in line with what you're going to deliver? If they're not, you've got to start right there at the top, right? When you get into your slides, you can start looking at, you know, the spark line, the story arc, whichever way you want to phrase that, but start going through and asking yourself at each stage, what is the assumptions made by the audience? Because believe it or not, you as a business person, you don't get to define what a good presentation mm. is. Good is defined by the audience. Good is defined by the sum of its results. So you can make something that you feel is great, but if the audience doesn't know that it delivers what they're hoping to receive, they're, they're not going to score it good, right? So we go through all the time and ask, what are the assumptions the audience is going to make about this? What is the assumption they're going to make uh, here? And then when you can look at all of that and you can answer those questions, you can then make design decisions that better inform the layouts of the slides, whether that becomes a really complex slide or a very simple slide. So that's one of the biggest tips that I give all of my clients is use the assumption filter to go through and, and test against the quality of your presentation. Way, I, I have another screen next to me. The people that are listening to the video will see me writing some things looking on the right hand side here. I actually have, a, <laughs> we use OneNote to take notes for all of the episodes and all that stuff. And we have, uh, funny enough. But point number eight <laughs> in our numbered list is the catchphrase to start the episode with, and it says in squares, uh, in brackets, minute. And I just wrote the 12th minute and wrote that quote, good is defined by your audience, which is going to be like that one thing that I just want to remind and more or less inform the people who is going to edit this, where are we looking at? What you said about good is not what right. you think it is. It is what the audience thinks it is, which is like mm -hmm. so so well set in the context of presentations like especially in the context of presentations mm. okay and it, and all of that like the idea about the assumptions is very very interesting what else anything else in regards in let's say a, a little bit if they move forward right and they have done this mm -hmm. exercise 
in regards to the design, like what's happening there? You are saying, hey, don't learn about layouts or uh, color psychology or all of that stuff, color theory or whatever. But how should they approach then their slides once they answer all of those assumptions? Yeah, uh, it's an important one, right? If so they have slides, right? this not gets every single this, time. yeah. This depends on whether or not they um, have a template. Do they have a corporate brand, right? So some of the people listening probably work at a company yeah. and and have a system. A lot of people might be independent business people and they're building their own presentations or pitch decks and things like that. One thing that I can tell you is there's there's a methodology. Um, I'm currently working with a CEO from a corporation called Grok, and and I'm head of creative there. Um, one of the things that he preaches a lot, and, and I have found this to be extremely helpful, is look at your, your presentation or any project you're working on and first ask yourself, is this a sound idea, right? Is it a complete idea? Is it a good idea is the next step, right? If you believe you have a sound idea, then ask yourself, is it a good idea? And, and, and now is it a complete idea? Have I checked all the boxes? And then you move into polish, right? And that's when you would normally start designing it. The challenge in that is most people, if they have a template or they have something they're working in, they tend to jump into the polish mode and then start populating it with content. And so this is very, very hard to move away from the decoration. So what we actually do with a lot of clients that need to start with decks from scratch is we make them work in the default black and white wireframe. I, I call it the wireframe template that comes with PowerPoint, right? Don't worry about how it looks yet get the flow down. So if you can answer all the assumptions, now you start looking at the flow and actually start populating your deck with content. Ask yourself, is this too much on a slide? Have I broken this out the right way? Because if you can get to that point where you can rehearse it, you, we've all heard the old analogy, good in, better out, right? But if you start with, I'll use healthy, you know, <laughs> professional language. If you start with bad in, then you're really just polishing bad at you the back end of the process, language, by the way. It's a right? <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I have a little bit of a pirate mouth, so I'm trying to avoid that. Um, but we don't want to get trapped. And this is what I see a lot of people doing. They're so intimidated that they're not a designer that they stress over the design quality first, and then they never actually focus on the content. And if the content's not good, the design won't make it much better. So you, you've got to really do that first. Now, to your point, then what do you do? So if you have this wireframe and you've got all the right material, now it's really about how do I delight my audience? How do I bring visual interest into this? And there's, there's the basic things, right? Is it legible? Um, is, it, uh, is it serving the material in a way that when I look at each slide, where do I look at first? So this is why Duarte used to make us show our designs to other people because you've been looking at it so long, yeah. you now have a bias. You don't know what you're looking at. But we actually, um, I think I was the first person there to do exercises with eye tracking software. And I used to put you know, goggles on people and say, hey, I want you to look at this deck. And I would track and see where they look at the presentation. And that would give me an actual scientific basis to say, are they looking at the thing I think they're looking at. Now, you, you don't have to have access to that technology because it's very expensive. It's about $5,000 for the goggles. Um, but you can show it to a peer and say, hey, I, I'm not asking you to learn the content. I just want to see what is the first thing you looked at. And that can really inform the design. If you ask yourself this question, where should emphasis be on every single slide? And that emphasis should fall in line with your content then you're probably designing the deck appropriately. Nancy Duarte did a, a presentation once where the entire deck, now realize this is a leader in her field with access to some of the greatest designers in this genre. And she created an entire presentation by using a Sharpie on post-it notes. And so she, she had a little yellow sticky and she wrote what the slide was supposed to be. And instead of designing the deck, we actually took photos of those notes and that's what we put in the center of every single slide. And that was her presentation. And and it, it was great. It could be very easily great, right? I mean, it's not every single time that, like, I don't know why people constantly push themselves to every single time to have slides. And then if they right. have them, oh, they for sure need to be in that so typical, like everything that I have been seeing up until now. Like I cannot risk, I cannot 
they are not even considering risking that much in that space because like it's just the way I have personally heard like feedback from our customers that from a potential customer back then that they don't see mm-hmm. and that was like when we when the company was starting so it's like five years ago or something so they don't see a reason to work with the presentation agency because once they get to a conference and that was back then when there were conferences uh, like in person sure when they present it seems like their presentation uh the presentation that they're delivering and the way it looks the technical part of the slides is like everyone else's so why should they right. bother because they are obviously doing it right and i was like okay, that is mm-hmm. the pro- like that that means from the business perspective that we need a lot of education here first you know like you cannot like it's so otherwise it will be very a very hard sell you need to educate those people first in order to change their mind potentially right because that's also not easy and then maybe but only maybe they will say okay I got you. This is how it should be. Let's fix it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the classic here is, um, you know, because we work in presentations, we constantly have to look at stories and metaphors Mm. and analogies. But uh, one thing that I always talk about in our shop is how do you delight the customer? How do you delight the audience? Right. I focus on the word delight a lot because it's, it represents experience. And so it's, if you follow all of the rules, you know, the guidance, I guess, in all of the books, right? Keep it simple. Don't over-decorate. Don't do this, right? Well, then you're, you're going to end up with a deck that's got, you know, black slides with white letters on them. And that's the only thing that's ever going to exist. Like, why do I need an icon? If I'm supposed to just look at one thing, then just put that word on the slide. And the problem with that is that minimalist approach is you actually cross a point on the curve where the audience is no longer having a delightful experience. And so the balance in here is not just that we have to make a targeted focus, but we think about the potential of how to be great, the potential of how to be good. And we can't always win those battles. Some clients just want their bullet list and some clients want the chart, right? But what the way I think about this is nobody wanted an iPhone when they made the iPhone. No, nobody was asking for that. There was nobody walking the streets saying, if only I could have my camera, my laptop, my phone, my calculator, my notepad all in my pocket. Nobody, nobody was saying that walking the streets, but Apple made the iPhone and we didn't even have the cell networks and the technology to handle what the iPhone became. The industry changed because of what the iPhone was, right? When, when the automotive industry were looking at building cars, nobody was saying, how do you make something different than a horse? There were a few innovators, but most people were saying, how do we get horses to carry more? How do we get them to go faster? This is the same thing with presentations. When someone tells you, hey, everybody at this event has the same template with the same line on the bottom and the logo in the bottom corner and all the cliches of, of PowerPoint templates. Um, if that's your measure of good, then you're definitely not trying to delight the audience, right? So you build and design to the potential of the experience, not to the minimum of status quo. Mm. And now we're in the world of virtual presentations. What is in in regards to in regards yeah. to the virtual world? What changed in your opinion? What should people know, and how should people adapt and? make sure like what are the steps that they need to take in order to delight you know and differentiate from everyone else yeah so um we've actually done some studies on this and we've partnered with some research groups on this so um uh no 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 that's 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 our ip (laughs) uh but i i will give some i will give some tips from it that's interesting um So for example, you know, in the virtual environment, uh, we did a survey on uh, a little over 4,000 people who regularly are audience members of Mm. virtual presentations. And we asked them, what is the scale and environment that you're normally seeing these presentations? And actually, um, a little, just beneath 80% of the audience members watch the presentation at, um, 
the upper left corner of their laptop around, you know, a half to one third of the size of their screen. So if you think about how small that is, that's very small. So what, what they're really doing is they're listening and they're glancing over at the slide, right? And so they're not reading the slides per se, which furthers the idea of traditional presentation best practices. Don't make it a document on the slide. When, when we realized that, this immediately had to reinform how we design slides. Um, it, made, it held us more accountable to making sure the focus point was present and immediate in what goes on the slide. So th the scale of that was massive. The second part in that survey was that audiences um, just felt like they, they weren't part of the experience. So when you have a presenter at an event, or even in a small boardroom, you're actually getting to interact with them just simply just using your body language, the way that you express yourself, the way that you move, you know, as a business person, this is very well studied and taught. Um, that gets lost when you're doing this, when you're on a camera, right? But even the simple gesture that I just did when I said this, and I brought my hand out, this is me looking like I'm having a conversation with you versus me being trapped on a camera and just yeah. talking in this little box. So it's important that all presenters and presentation makers understand that they're having a conversation and a dialogue with an audience. So how do you do that, right? How do you make it more yeah. conversational? Now you see lots of people putting things in like, yeah. oh, I use polls, uh, we do quizzes. This is great. That, that really, really helps if you can react live on the fly. But just getting down to where your conversational techniques are things like, I'll give you an example uh, that we just did in a project. Uh, this C-level executive said, the point I need to get across is we've had 91% uh, growth in the last quarter. Okay. Yep. Simple data. The design approach would be put 91% big and on the slide. Clean, focused, I win, I'm doing good. But if he is in the call and he says, what does everyone on the call think our percentage of growth has been in the last mm. quarter? You're probably wondering if we've done well. You're probably wondering this, right? He's making it conversational. And then if he says, well, I bet you have a number in your head. Let's see if you're, see if you're right. And then you animate in or show the slide that says 91% growth and you unpack that, you did two things. You asked the audience to answer a question. When you do that, you ask them to focus. You ask them to make an assumption. And then you recalibrate and correct the assumption by what you then show as a result. That technique is moving, this is our language that we use here, moving passive audiences yeah. to activated audiences. And in the virtual world, that is more important than ever. That is, by the way, also building tension this way. Like just the fact that you're asking something similar builds tension, I think, in the audience. Mm -hmm. And when you build tension, you get the Completely. attention. I mean, it, it's very, very easy, I would say. Of course, I'm saying easy, not that it is easy, but it's not that complicated or hard or impossible for the business professional who is listening. Hey, can I flip my script this way? Can I present some mm. data points this way like why not like this is like why not of yeah. course what else do you see changing in the virtual world like especially in, like let's go into because you mentioned hey the interaction is crucial obviously then turning it into a conversation what about the design you said that hey this is just one third of the upper left corner is being consumed so that is tricky mm -hmm. <laughs> by itself is very tricky very. and then they go back to listening but anything else that you are seeing maybe from the study maybe not that you would say hey when you're presenting over microsoft teams or zoom or whatever it may be careful here careful here adapt those slides if you have used those slides for an in-person meeting this way change them a little bit in that way for the virtual environment like anything there yeah. So th the number one thing that I've been pushing on people in this area is um, understand that. W so anybody that knows basic design theory knows that mm -hmm. contrast is important, right? If we have strong contrast, we can increase legibility. 
But if contrast is too strong, then, you know, it can be a little obnoxious and a little punchy. So this is why the trend in presentation design for the last 10 years, you, you see people not doing black and white as a contrast example, but they might do charcoal gray and very light gray because it's got enough contrast, but it's not so strong that it hurts the eyes. And that's important if you're sitting in, in a huge room with a 60 foot screen and, um, you know, you don't want to hurt the audience, right? You don't, you don't want to get what I call the TV tan uh, from it being too strong. However, contrast changes with scale, right? And as you start reducing the size, that dark gray to light gray gets a little less effective. So I, I tell people that you really need to evaluate contrast ratios to make sure that it, it stands up. Now, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, if, if you want to be a, a design you know, practitioner, then you really should just read a couple articles about contrast ratio. Um, Netflix actually includes this in their brand guidelines. They say that all design uh, color configurations need to adhere to a three to one contrast ratio. If it does not adhere to this, we do not consider this compliant. It is not yeah. accessibility compliant, and therefore it is not visually acceptable by Netflix. I think that's brilliant that they do that. Um, three to one is about right if you want it to work on a small screen. If you can go higher than that, that's great. Yeah. So there are tools online. I believe Microsoft even has some. Adobe has one with their color.adobe.com where you can put in color swatches and there's an accessibility checker and it will tell you if it is um, going to work for various forms of visual impairment. There are color ratio tools online where you can enter your RGB or hex values and see, and it'll actually show you what does text look like on this background color. Now, this is a level of engineering that's probably more work yeah, than most business right. people are going to take. But if you've got, you know, I know the presentation designer from Oracle and her argument, uh, Shannon's argument normally is, if you're building a deck to go talk to someone about a half a million to a million dollar deal, yeah, put the effort in, right? This matters. And so knowing the virtual environment, that contrast quality changes over scale, and we know the scale is dramatically reduced, you really should be thinking about that as a test. All the other rules apply, make sure the text is big enough, et cetera, et cetera. But the contrast one is way, big. You have been... Like especially Duarte, I think will be very interesting use case. But you saying the Oracle guys and hey, especially Oracle. I'm coming from the IT world where we were in competition with not me, but our the product that we were working with right. was in the Microsoft space. So it was in constant competition with Oracle. Uh, I know that in in the Oracle world, I don't know if you have heard this one or if it's a global type of thing. But uh, in the Oracle world, there is something that. Uh, they say to themselves and internally that if the deal is less than a million, they don't even play, you know, like it's that world <laughs> in compared to the Microsoft world. And if there is no a lot of money involved, they're like, thank you. Uh, we are not here. <laughs> like we don't play here, which by the way, back then was very true. Like, especially I was in the database field. It was sure. very true. Like if, if the licenses mm. for the software were not above a million dollars, they were like, uh, please don't uh, like don't even talk to us it's not important to us but what are the i, I just because you said it but i just wanted to see what are the biggest because many business people you said hey just spend the time if it's mm -hmm. important spend the time if you're chasing half million dollar deal or a bigger or even smaller one right even smaller like what mm -hmm. are the biggest successes that you have seen can you come up, do you have something that you rem you remember very vividly where just one presentation, except for Apple, okay, maybe except for Apple, where just one presentation completely flipped over absolutely everything for a company, for a business, or for a person, for that matter? Sure. Uh, I was working with one startup um, that is a, mm -hmm. as a technology company. Uh, this was yeah. last year. And... Um, now, they didn't tell me this at the time, but they were um, really only about six months away okay. from running out of money. And they didn't tell me that, right? And, and nor should they have. But there was a presentation that I was asked to work on that was a pitch deck 
to not to pitch to a particular investment group, but there was a group where they had asked this CEO to come in and educate them on the industry that they were in. So not necessarily their product or service, but hey, you seem to be a thought leader in this space. Would you come teach our partners um, who are an investment firm about that technology? And so this was very tricky because you didn't want it to come across as a like a pitch deck. You didn't want it to be too salesy. That's not the role he was invited to be a part of. It was purely to be an educator and influencer and thought leader. But he also knew that there were people in this room that could literally invest in their company. And so we worked on that presentation almost daily for a minimum of two to three hours together for about a month. Um, everything from what is the story to what goes on the slides yeah. to rehearsing with him, practicing his cadence and his delivery, everything to get it completely perfect. Um, he literally called me from the airport before flying out to this event and rehearsed with me in the terminal. Uh, he's like, people are walking by me and I'm, it's crazy. When he got to deliver that and I, I was sitting at my phone going, okay, I know he's literally delivering right now. Um, he finished. I, I heard nothing. He, another hour went by. I heard nothing. Three hours go by. I hear nothing. About five hours later, he messages me and says, one of these partners just came up and offered me $28 million. And immediately I went, wow, like really? Now that company, uh, a year later, um, they are fully funded. They are have a very, very long uh, yeah. runway of investment. And um, in their particular space, they have the largest round of investment ever in history for wow. that industry. Um, so watching a company that started at one deck and look, did the deck do that? No, they have an amazing product, right? The product has to be good. But to be able to gain trust and faith comes from having that message being executed correctly. And so that to me is one of those times where I've seen other wins, but that one to me was like, wow, that was a pivot point yeah. for this that company. That was a big one for sure. A big deal, especially for a startup, like, especially for a startup, yeah. like that is a huge, huge amount of money. Anyway, that was in the U S mm -hmm. right. Yeah. That was in the U S and they've used that deck. They, you know, they, like any presentation that's been modified over time. Um, but I bet you the seed of that one deck now has probably generated almost $200 million for them. Yeah. With roughly. slight modifications, depending on the case, depending on the audience. Mm -hmm. So if uh, 200 million is not Correct. enough for you guys, well, don't deal with presentations. <laughs> uh, like, yeah, we, by the way, exactly what you're saying. We had a case, but we're here in Bulgaria where the market is completely like so different. Obvi obviously. Totally so different. Two sure. years ago, we did an IPO. This was the first IPO that we were invited to do. And this was the first time ever that somebody called us six months in advance, right? And I was like, wow, I got this call, phone call. And to be honest, hopefully they're not listening to this one. But when they called, they called, they said the company name and I didn't hear it, mm -hmm. you know, but I was like, okay, I'll come to the office. No worries, etc." And then I show up in the office <laughs> and I see that this is a product that I definitely don't know about. And I don't know about it because it's in the food and that in the, that industry and I'm vegetarian and they're selling meat and all that stuff. Mm. And the CMO, the, the, the chief marketing officer actually welcomed me. And she was like, uh, we're waiting for the, um, whoever the name is. And it was, he is the CFO mm -hmm. of the company. And I'm like, wait a minute, in my head, I'm like, why do I have a meeting with the CMO and the CFO at the same time? So he got, the CFO comes yeah, a big deal. to the meeting. Uh, we get to know each other for a minute or so. Uh, and he's like, we only wait for one more person. He actually runs the company. He's the CEO of this company and this hospital. And I'm like, <laughs> in my head, like, there the is trifecta. no reason at all to have the three C-level executives in the same room with me for a simple presentation, like mm -hmm. no reason at all. And he entered like right. the typical CEO. He was on the call, dropped his headphones and he was like, welcome, welcome, whatever. We are going to um, be working on an IPO. And I'm like, oh, now that 
now I understand what's going on. Six yeah. months of preparation on and on, but they right. ended up the second biggest in our country, which in the Bulgarian market, um, they raised 42 million uh, euro. So that is around 50 million uh, US dollars equivalent. Yeah. And that was the craziest, like the craziest project ever that we have done, but still six months in advance and just one presentation. And I always say exactly yeah. what you said. It was not the deck, you know, it's not the presentation right. per se, but it's the combination of things, mm -hmm. the product itself, plus what you said, hey, if you didn't have it, like, are you willing to risk? Like, are you willing to put right. it, put that amount of money on, like, are you willing to go there? Because this is a lot of money, like a lot. Yeah. This is, this is one of those things that I think business people need to learn, right? That I, I work with a lot of sales orgs and salespeople yeah. are very charismatic. Um, you know, th yeah. it's one of their superpowers is being charismatic. But the thing is, is there's a point where being charismatic and winging it yeah. is not polished. And so one of the things that we try to push people to do is to say, um, it could be an act, but we'd yeah. rather it be a habit. And when you go through this to the point where it's like sickening you to work on this deck some more, you are probably in a place where it's starting to become a habit. And that's, you know, when, when you see it in your sleep, when you, when you're taking the shower and you're looking at the foggy door and you're drawing out your slide and remembering how the, the, the piece looks, yeah. then it's a habit. And so you have to evaluate what is worth making something a habit. But there are core stories for any business person that should be a habit. And they know their they know their touch points, right? But how you interact with the slide, knowing your content versus delivering your content to the audience, feeling like you can stand up in front of it, right? Like I have multiple decks that I use for our agency. I don't need to look at the slide. I know seven clicks in exactly which slide I'm on, and I know exactly what I'm saying at the seventh click. Yeah. That's a habit. And so when you're talking about being part of an IPO and P working with a C-level org, now you see it, right? They know what that mattered and they knew that how long does it take for me to make this a habit, right? How do, how do we get from sound to yeah. good to polished? And that's what it takes. Now, not everybody can commit that, but if you think about the value of the presentation you're working on and scale that down, it still matters. There's a lady that I worked with at Dell who, um, uh, her name's Jenny. When she became, got promoted to a director level at Dell, um, she came to us and asked us to coach her on presentation design. And so we did, and there was no project. She's like, I just want you to help me get better. So we looked at existing projects and decks and slides. We talked about them, everything from, from ground up. Today, one of her most proud components of her personal brand at Dell is that she's known as having the greatest presentations and everybody wants copies of her slides so they can use them as a template. And what's funny is that did raise the bar for everybody else. They are doing better because of her, but no one is quite as good as her at delivering it. And the reason is, is because the habit of how those slides were built were tailored to her. And so this is the same idea. Like if you buy a great camera, are you a good photographer? No. Right. If you buy the most expensive guitar, are you a great guitarist? No. You buy the fastest car. You're not a race car driver. But if it's something that you tailor and practice to you, then you can yeah. become great at it. And, and now she's at a point where, you know, this was three years ago. We started with her. Now she has a library of about 150 slides that she, it's her toolbox and she maintains them and she rehearses with them. And, she still calls us every, you know, maybe once a quarter just to like run through ideas. But now she's absolutely powerful in that company because of that Which habit. Means, hey, if you're spending the time to build incredible slides, collect them, you know, like. Yeah. The, oh, sandboxing is a massive technique that people should practice. And, and I don't think enough people really do practice that is build your sandbox um, that will that will accelerate any project yeah, and that you work pay on. Off so many times, <laughs> so many times. Yes, that's true. Okay, I wanted to talk about the future of presentations, but we are, let's sure. jump in there very quickly because we are very much very close sure. to running out of time. But 
we can talk <laughs> obviously on that topic for many many hours and days or who knows months uh what about the sure. future like you love talking about the future of tech and overall what do you see in the future of presentations what does that mean for the people that are listening like what do you see yeah so one presentations aren't going away right um as much as people say oh we don't want any more slides in our meetings and we don't no more powerpoint and you read these articles this ceo has banned powerpoint from their company and you know all this kind of nonsense like it's it's a yeah. communication vehicle it's not about the program or what it is it's a communication vehicle um so those aren't going away and if anything i think the future is going to make them more dynamic and i don't mean more animation and more 3d models and more media and things like that but i think the future means more integration with the audience and more with the host who is the presenter right so we know that for example who who led the charge on the future of presentations Did, like who would you say is doing something in the last two years that you believe is defining the future of presentations you mean Sure. As the delivery, delivery vehicle. vehicle. That's interesting. Like I personally was quite impressed in what Prezi pulled off, like with Prezi video, uh, mm -hmm. was very impressed sure. with what Microsoft did with HoloLens and all of those battles in regards to those smaller glasses that potentially can become this next thing. Who else made mm -hmm. an impression on me? Are we talking about the technology itself? Well, you know, for me, what influenced us, uh, when we all went virtual, right? Yeah. We all went re remote. Suddenly we saw jobs yeah. dropping left and right. And then a few months later, they all popped back up and everyone said, how do we, how do we okay. deliver these virtually? And I said, well, uh, there's a few thousand kids on Twitch this. and YouTube who stream every day. And they're striking up millions of views and they're having great engagement the response with their audiences <laughs> from the youngsters, right? So these are not groomed business people, but they are speaking in the language of their audience and they're trustable and they have credibility and, and they're proving they know what they're doing. And so they had figured out how to stream, how to get good content, right? And uh, I looked at them and said, this is the future of presentations. We have to look at this and learn from them, right? Being candid, doing these short form um, presentations, putting themselves in the lower corner, figuring out how to rig a green screen at home, doing polls and doing live interactivity, doing live chats during it and having moderators who are fielding the questions in the chat while interacting with you as the host. Suddenly we've actually all come full circle and realized that virtual presentations are not very different than broadcast media working in live television yep. or television in general. So I think the technologies that we're seeing are really, really interesting. But to me, the future of presentations is broadcast media and understanding what are the best practices in broadcast media. The perception for years has been, we can't do that because that's so expensive. But I know, I know a kid here in Austin who is 14 years old. He has a studio in his bedroom that he built. He streams every few days and he was actually featured in our, our local paper. Um, he's generating close to $2 million in revenue a year in his stream. And his parents obviously are supporting him. Um, but this kid, if you look at the demographics, he's not being watched by other kids his age. He's being watched by adults. He's being watched by uh, like the full spectrum all across the world. And there's something about what he does that resonates with people. And so, you know, you can no longer say, oh, TV has to be a beautiful person. TV has to be great makeup. TV has to be this, that, or the other. There's a pulse that resonates with people. And, and that is being live, being real, being credible. So to me, that part is the oh, future of presentations. I definitely need to check this little fella and his success that sounds incredible <laughs> and it doesn't surprise me at all to be honest like twitch really exploded i it was like six months ago or something when i first heard that amazon actually owns twitch and i was like jesus these guys are so clever mm -hmm. like <laughs> amazon and jeff bezos <laughs> just so so ahead of everything anyway 
who else should we get on this podcast? What do you think? Now that we are in the top three, how do we move to top two? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, with, our, uh, through our, uh, with the help of our guests. <laughs> what do you think? Oh one, my goodness! One, just one person um, from the business world, or from the tech world, or from uh, from any world, even from the presentation space. That for some reason, for one reason or the other, you are like, you connect their name with great presentations or with care about presentations and how they present something related. Uh, I mean, you know, I know this is going to sound like I'm I'm doing a little bit of a plug, but I but I'm so in just in admiration of the people that we okay. get at the click conference and of all the people that present at the click conference, uh, also- Nolan, who you mentioned from the podcast, earlier, yep. Nolan is amazing. I mean, I I've learned more from Nolan in the last year than I might've learned from anybody in the last few years. So I, I just think what Nolan's doing is so direct, so candid, so effective. Um, to me, he sets a new bar. And so I think he's spectacular. Um, and then of course, if you could get anybody and truly anybody, uh, I always go with Gar Reynolds. Gar is spectacular. Um, he's obviously got the yeah. presentation Zen book, he, but he's one of those people that doesn't just write theory. People actually connect with yeah. what he tries to teach them. And it, it's very real. So those, those are sort of the design production side all the yeah. way through to we the ideology no one, side. But we still... We still don't have Gar on the podcast. And I personally was, I completely changed the way I see presentations back at the university when I first saw presentations and design the first edition. And so that, by the way, his book mm. actually changed my, like, com- like my view about presentations completely. So I definitely need to check how to, I, to get to him because I don't think he's very easy to connect. But maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. I'll try and uh, we'll give you an update on that one. Yeah, he's a he's an amazing guy. Uh, every time him and I talk, it's more about music yeah. and playing instruments than it yeah. is about presentations. He's a we he's a wonderful human him. being. By the way, when we publish this episode, we can tag him in the in the show in the in the copy saying, "Hey, we <laughs> talked about you. We talked about you." <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But I'll definitely try to gar, uh, to get Gar for sure. He can speak a ton about presentations last one where can people find more about what you're doing in your agency and what is the best platform for people to connect if they have questions i'm again writing uh so yeah so yeah so that's a couple questions um i will take the last one first anybody that wants to reach out to me your best options are twitter uh facebook and linkedin okay um i'm fairly active on twitter now so that's a good place to message me um on Facebook, I have a page that's called facebook.com slash life by pixels. That's kind of my everything around design, creativity, Perfect. business that I share there. And then uh, so they can reach me there. And then, you know, we don't share a lot of what the agency does because A, we're busy and B, so much of it is, uh, you know, NDA material. But I do often share projects on those pages. I share on Behance. Um, but the number one place is find me at conferences, right? So I speak at the click conference. I speak at Adobe max. Uh, I, I speak at probably 12 to 14 events a year. And so, um, if they follow me on social media, they'll get to see where and when I'm doing those events. And sometimes they're free and, uh, they can see the work that we do there. And we'll need to make sure that we figure out how to get you for present to succeed 2022 too, but that's a topic for another email, you know, I'll. I'll ping you after the podcast on, <laughs> on that topic for sure, because this podcast will, will air after the event. And I got to know you sure. like, was it two or three months ago? I don't even remember. And then we already had all of the, the whole lineup. When you were in the podcast of uh, the presentation sure. podcast, then I was like, wait a minute, we, I definitely need to know him. And so we'll <laughs> make sure we'll get you for Present to Succeed 2022. Whatever it takes, we'll make it happen. Hopefully so. So, uh, awesome. Mark, like that was great. Like so many things. I hope people enjoyed listening. I'm sure they enjoyed listening. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I'll make sure that we link absolutely everything and we put all of your social media profiles in the show notes. All of them. And also, if you if someone has a question, are you against me tagging you in that question so that both of us reply? 
Perfect. No, that's so totally if fine. If someone has a question or comment, I'll tag you so that you also make sure that you see it. Not that we are not going to tag you in first place, but that's, that's another story. Perfect. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time. It was a blast having you. And for sure, we need to spend way more time probably just talking just about one topic. That one about the future of presentations has something in it and analyzing the, the behavior of the streamers and what we can learn from them. I think maybe a very interesting discussion itself, but I need to get, I need to be a little bit more prepared on that one because I'm, to be honest, not prepared there. <laughs> anyway, thanks for joining again. Hope you also enjoy that one. Also, everyone, uh, take a look at what Mark is doing all across the social media space. He's everywhere, as you can see, Behance, conferences, LinkedIn, Facebooks, etc. Take a look at our website, 356labs.com, present to succeed conference, which Mark is, I guarantee, already going to be part of in the 2022 uh, world and yeah if you hope you enjoyed it thanks for listening and subscribe if subscribe if you liked it and share with uh, share it with a friend thanks for listening and see you in the next one